as far as this course is concerned, we're done with propagation and all of this link budget analysis. We're now positioning to system level stuff. And we're going to assume that the link is taken care of. And now we're trying to use the transponders in the most efficient way. The satellites are expensive, right? They're expensive hardware. They're expensive to operate. They're expensive to launch. And, uh, and uh, the only, and, and further, the most expensive part is the spectrum, right? There's just so much of it. So when you all add all of this together, it is a luxury that you cannot afford to have that thing up in space and you not use it to the full of its potential. So what we're going to go over next is in these next three, four lectures, is thinking, talking about how you make sure that this satellite is used with multiple users so that, you know, and what are the different trade-offs and how you make sure that uh, you get your money back, right? Because what you charge for is the airtime or, or the data throughput or whatever gets delivered to the satellite. And to do that, sometimes you can get a single user and single pop, but a lot of times you have multiple users sharing the same satellite. And what we're going to go over is the multiple access schemes that allow us to do so. And we're going to discuss and see that it's a little bit different than in terrestrial networks. Some things that work well in terrestrial world do not work well in satellites, and we're going to just discuss these trade-offs. So um, what I'm going to talk about first is um, there are two things that uh, are covered in this chapter. And uh, I want to actually, I don't know if it's clear on the slide, but I want to spend, uh, there's, there, a frequently source of a confusion, and not only in satellite, it's just in general, uh, one of the th those things that people get confused. There is something called multiplexing, and there's something called multiple access, right? What is the difference? Multiplexing usually refers to uh, data aggregation, right? You have usually a single point that is a, is a sync of various data streams, that you now multiplex on a single line going forward. Typical, the best example of the multiplexing you have in a telephony or also internet traffic. Think about us calling you, right? The, that telephone call, you cannot afford to draw a single, line, a single optical fiber for every connection that goes between here and Europe. The way how you would approach that, you would take everybody from Florida and everybody you know, let's say from Georgia and everybody from southern states and, and kind of aggregate them all together and then this entire traffic would go through a single fiber line to the other end and then it would be parsed out going different places. So you have two processes. One is multiplexing where you do the traffic aggregation and the other is demultiplexing that happens at, a, at the point, uh, the end point. In between, you have high capacity link that carries all of this trap. Now, take, uh, take that fiber out and put the satellite link instead of it. And that's what we have in satellite communication. As a matter of fact, most of the telephony used to go through satellite because even though they're expensive, uh, satellite launching a satellite was cheaper than laying the fiber down the, down the seabed of Atlantic. Now it's a little bit different. We have a lot of fiber, so rarely do telephone uh, calls go through satellite, but there's still a lot of remote areas where the only way to connect them is through satellite. Right? But uh, it is rarely that you have single, you have aggregation on one point, and usually the satellite uh, station or the what satellite hub is connected to a building that we call data center, where all of this aggregation happens, everything is put together and then sent to the high capacity link to the satellites. So this is called a multiplexing. And although, uh, and, and so that's the first one. And then you have multiple access. Multiple access is different. You have a single uh, resource that in our case is a transponder, or you can think of it even as a satellite as a whole. And then you have multiple points that are trying to communicate to this resource. So you have then competing for or sharing this common resource. And the way how they perform this sharing is what we refer to as multiple access. So uh, unfortunately, the, the, the names are similar, but they mean quite different things. One is the putting all this traffic on a single line, and the other one is 
accessing the, the, the network through, uh, from various users. Right? Let me just spend a couple of minutes on, a, on, a multi, on multiplexing. Uh, so it is, as I said, it's common in many, in pretty much in, in all the communication where it goes long distance. And long distance is a little stretchable term, you know, sometimes long distance me means across the Atlantic, sometimes it's just from here to Orlando, yeah, right? You don't want to connect them many lines, you just have a single line and all the traffic from here will go through that single line to Orlando. But wherever you try to go over longer distances, you try to make these links broadband and you try to aggregate a lot of traffic before you send it over the, over the line. There used to be uh, different ways of multiplexing data, right? Uh, if, we were, if we were to talk about multiplexing maybe, uh, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, the most common way to multiplex signal would be in frequency domain, right? You would take the signals, you would put them in the different parts of the spectrum, and you would send them over to the other one where you would bring them all to basement and demodulate. And in your book, they explain that system. It's still used, but very rarely. It's a single-sided uh, AM modulation, and they talk about for telephony, 4 kilohertz, and, and you know, primary groups, and so on. That system is going away, because this entire world is going away from analog modulation. This was an analog system. But it worked well for many, many years. What we have today, and vast majority of the modern infrastructure, is based on the time division multiplex. Time division multiplexing means that you aggregate everything in the time domain where you have time slots and, and different users using different portions of the time. And uh, the reason why time domain multiplexing is, is the one that prevails is it, it because it is well suitable for optical fibers. Optical fibers, essentially, you are um, shining a light, right? So and you're always kind of operating on off. You either have a light on or light off. So it's, it's, so it's a, a Baseband. There is really no translation. The, uh, there is frequency component to it because the frequency of the light might change. But really, you know, there is no such thing as modulating on a carrier and translating to a different portion of the spectrum. You're just turning on and off a different laser wavelengths in a multi-wave uh, uh, fiber. Uh, so all of our internet and all of our telephony run in using a TDM multiplex. And there are several standards out there, actually three major standards, that exist how this aggregation is done. Uh, there is what is called North American or T1 based standard. There is a European or E1 based, and there's also Japanese standard, which is very similar to, to the American channel. How do they work? Uh, Remember, we talked a little bit about it in digital communication, but uh, let me just give you a, a basic idea here. You have a user one, user two, up to n users, and they are now connected to a single line, and then they are at the T multiplexing point, they're parsed up. So this would be user one, user two, and user n. Now, each one of these would go in RB bits per second. So you have, you know, n lines, each one of them uh, being in RB bits per second, and then you have a switch kind of. It's not really a switch, but you can you can think of it as being uh, equivalent to a switch that connects this line to appropriate point at the other. Now, if the rate on each one of them is RB, what should be the rate on this line? N, or n times Rb. So the rate here is n times Rb. So if there is a packet here that lasts this long, then here it would be compressed to this. Right? So if this is a user 1, this would be user 1. And then you would have user 2, user 3, and so on, user n, and then again <coughs> user 1. Right? So that's how it works. So this is user this rate needs to deliver the set, not user two, user one again, right? This line here needs to deliver the same uh, amount of data that this guy generates in n times shorter time because it's shared among n different users. 
And now, how does it work? Well, if you if I now go from here and say, okay, well, now I can treat this whole line as a new user, and then I can have another line like that, another line like that, and then I can multiplex these guys, you, you end up with something which we call digital hierarchy. And let me just give you, uh, so so this is how, this is a, what, what we call, call zero level. This will be then first level, you know, second level, and so on, right? You can have multiple levels of aggregation. Every time this line would combine certain number of these, which would be this times these, n times of these and so on. So you get all of them kind of kind of merging into one big river that flies on the other side. And the responsibility of the other side is to parse this out and then look at the addresses and where these things are going and switch it appropriately in a different direction. And uh, this is done in both of our telephony and our internet. Uh, it's done a little bit differently because in, in Telephony traditionally it's circuit switch, so you reserve the path, but you carry no address. In internet, there is no reserve path, but every packet carries the address of where it's going. Right? So, so it's slightly different, but the idea is very similar to the physical layer. They all use optical fibers and time division multiplexes. Now, here you have how these multiplexes work. At the zeroth level, in pretty much all of these communication schemes, because all of them come traditionally from voice, they all start with a minimum assignable unit of 64 kilobits per second. Where is this 64 kilobits per second coming from? Voice. Voice, right? Voice is sampled at 8 kilobits, uh, 8 kilo samples per second, and encoded with 8 bits per sample. So 8 times 8, 64 kilobits per second is, is this input here. And then, you know, then we go differently and aggregate differently. On the next slide, I believe I have an example of the North American or, or of the first system. So you start with, uh, with uh, each one of these uh, voice capacity channels, 64 kilobits per second, and you take 24 of these guys and you aggregate them into a single line. And this line is a known line. It's almost considered as a, you know, even though, even though you can, you go to DS0 or 64 kilobit per second channel, really the, the smallest unit that we operate is the T1 line, right? You can, and you hear communication engineers talk about 1T, 2T, or 3Ts, or however many Ts, meaning this incremental capacity of 1.544 uh, megabits per second. Now, there's, uh, you, can, you can take four of these and you aggregate this into T2 line, and then you can take seven T2s and aggregate into, into one T3 and then six T3 to aggregate in, in the T4. And these are the throughput you get. For T1 line, it's 1.544. For T2 line, it's 6.312. For T3, 45 megabits and 274 megabits per second. So uh, there is this interim one in between, which is called T1C, which is just two T1 lines you know, aggregation. Now, this whole thing was designed to carry voice. So when you carry voice, then you really have 64 kilobit per second as a minimum assignable, uh, assignable bandwidth, right? Because you're carrying voice, that's the minimum, you need to, minimum bandwidth that you need to carry the voice. So that's assignable, and this is called channelized use of, of, a, of a digital hierarchy, where you respect the channelization. You say, I'm giving you 30, 33 channels or five channels or how long, however many increments of 64 kilobits per second you need. Now, a lot of times, you know, if you go data, then maintaining channelization is not really required, especially if you pro provision the equipment on, on both ends, right? If you're provisioning transmitter and receiver, so you're communicating with yourself. So then, in that case, let's say you have your transmitter and your receiver and you have T1 hierarchy implemented to support T3 then, then you don't really have to respect the channelization. You can use this entire thing as a pipe of a certain capacity. So if you have, let's say, data stream that's, I don't know, 117 kilobits per second, then you can say, oh, okay, let me 
assign one point something T1 line, and then the rest of the bits I can fill in with some other data and some other data. So as long as you know how to parse it on your end, uh, that, uh, that, that, you, that is commonly done. And that's, this is very much done in, in a, a backhaul of, of, of both satellite and terrestrial systems. I, I'm more familiar with cellular systems because I used to work on that, but like for example, if you have a base station, you know that in, in GSM, for example, the voice is compressed on 8 kilobits per second. Wasting a 64 kilobit per second channel to carry only 8 kilobit per second of voice is, is not a good idea. So you pack four voice channels on one DS0 and send it on the other end to the, to the switch and then there it gets parsed, converted to 64 kilobits per second and that's where it enters the regular PCM. This way you can save four four times on T1 lines. And this is also true in the sa satellite networks. Let's say if you're trying to get some throughput through the satellite, you have equipment on both ends. There is no way, no, and you're not going to switch in the middle of, of the sky. So this whole pipe can be treated as a whole, and then you just use it as a whole. So then you don't have to maintain the strict channelization as long as you understand what you're doing. Uh, besides T1, I guess there is an E1 hierarchy. The, the, that one is also very, very popular. As a matter of fact, most of the world uses E1 hierarchy. It's it's a it's slightly different. It is newer, so to speak, in uh, development. So it's a little bit more advanced. Uh, there is 32 channels instead of having in-band signaling, like in the case of uh, T1, where you steal one bit every now and then from your voice and convert that into signaling. Here there are two separate signaling channels. So there's 30 voice channels and two signaling channels in roughly two megabits per second of throughput. And then you can see the aggregation, you know, how many of them are aggregated at, the, at the every different level. Okay. So that's that's how how the terrestrial network works. And then you can think of all of these T1 and T's, T1s and T2s, T3s, they're all coming to a data center. They're all aggregated in data center. And then you have a pipe that you need to now send the satellite <coughs> to satellite to the other end. A lot of times, you're going to have a transponder in the sky that talks to multiple base stations. Now, not base stations, earth stations. Each of these earth stations now needs to have a multiple access to that transponder. Right? And then they're going to share the transponder bandwidth to deliver their data on the other side. So that, that is called multiple access. And uh, usually in satellite, when we talk about what is actually implemented, then as your book says, you have to kind of say several things. You say, OK, this is how the aggregation is done. Like for example, here I'm saying it's time division multiplexing. So the data is time division multiplex, but I'm using FDMA on the access side. Or I can have time division multiplexing, single connection per carrier FDMA. I'll explain these things as we go along. But there are several things that are concatenating, concatenated in, this, in these descriptions to tell you how actually communication is done through the satellite to the other end. OK, so let's talk about fundamental fundamental access schemes. The situation here is not uh, different than in any other communication that we are familiar with. There are essentially three basic access schemes. Uh, there is frequency division multiple access, time division, and co-division multiple access. Uh, they are different in a, in a way how they use signaling uh, dimensions. There are several dimensions to signaling. This one is the time, the other one is frequency, and the third one is code in this case. We have some other dimensions that uh, are not in these, these um, three basic schemes. Also, it is not necessary that they are exclusive, right? A lot of times, if you think about it, everything is going to be frequency division of multiple axes to begin with. Because even if you're using the entire transponder, Satellite has multiple transponders, each one of them working on its separate channel. So now if you have, if you treat the whole satellite spectrum as one resource, 
then the base station or the earth stations now will be operating on different channels utilizing this spectrum in the frequency division multiple axis. But that's really not the focus of our discussion. Our discussion here is how to how to utilize the bandwidth from a single transponder in a different axis schemes. So let's uh, let's uh, talk about the the, the one that. Uh, I guess is still the most dominant one. It's a frequency division multiple axis. This is the, I guess, the basic uh, axis scheme that we have in pretty much any kind of communication system. It's, uh, it comes straight from a, a modulation property of a Fourier transform, right? It goes back to your, to your uh, I guess, uh, junior year or something like that, right? And this is basically saying that I can send the signals, multiple signals to the same medium, uh, provided the two conditions that they're band limited, and then I translate them into non-overlapping portions of a spectrum. And there are many systems that function that, that way. All of our broadcast systems are pretty much that way, right? If you think about all of the radio broadcasts, the thing that they shout when they announce 81.5 or, or whatever, 103.7, these are the central frequencies, and there's 150 kilohertz around it that uh, they occupy bandwidth, and then every point two megahertz is another station, right? So they're sharing these radio waves and the frequency domain multiple axis. Here, the situation is the same. You have the bandwidth of the transponder, you take the bandwidth of the transponder, and you divide it into non-overlapping chunks of the spectrum, and then you assign these non-overlapping chunks of the spectrum Two individual Earth stations, each one of them operating, operating, you know, in, in, in its own spectrum. However, the situations are here slightly different than in the example that I, I quoted you earlier. Satellite is not the end point. Satellite is the receiver, but also the transmitter. So we have to place some restrictions on how these guys would operate so that they can effectively share the transponder uh, transponder space. Uh, there are uh, two ways how I guess I guess how this is done. Uh, again, first let's talk about good side of it. The good side of it is that there are very there are few restrictions on the earth station themselves. They're essentially operating their own portion of the spectrum and they don't have to be mutually synchronized. Uh, but they still need to be polite to one another because they're received at the same spot. And in, not here, in, in a couple of slides, I'm going to define what that actually means. And you will see that uh, that because it is satellite is not the end point, it's not the, the receiver, there are some, some uh, restrictions that we need to put on, on the behavior of the earth stations. There is uh, guard bands that you know, these, these are non overlapping spectra, but you cannot butt one against the other. They have to be separated in a, in a frequency domain by some guard bands. I'll talk a little bit later how these guard bands are different. But at this point, you can see that there is already an inefficient source of inefficiency there. If you're, the spectrum is way too <coughs> expensive to be wasted on guard bands, right? Because guard bands are essentially no no money making portions of the spectrum. There's nothing being sent there. They're just there so that the system can work. The other, the other portions of the spectrum can be utilized. So you want to make sure that the garments are as small as, as they need to be uh, used. Now, there are two kinds of assignments. There is a fixed assignment where you say, OK, you earth station, you get this portion of the spectrum, and it's going to be fixed for your operation. Uh, and there is a dynamic assignment where you can assign the uh, very the portion of the spectrum that, that are assigned to a particular earth station. You can see that obviously that there are efficiency gains that are get by dynamic assignment because you can now use that to shape, uh, to respond to the shape of the traffic. There are costs associated with this because you have to have a radio resource management and additional signaling. And there are, you know, originally most, almost all of the systems were with a fixed assignment. Now we're moving away from it in, in a, in a, in a uh, I guess, 
striving to gain more efficiency. But this is the picture that you, you should have in your mind when you think about frequency division multiple access. This is the transponder bandwidth. That's the available resource. And then I have here three satellite uh, uh, communications hooked up together. These are the garments that separate them. Notice they're deliberately drawn at a different power. That's one of the things that I'm going to discuss specifically. Uh, so, because <coughs> the communications many to one, you have potential for what is called near-far problem, that uh, the power difference between these guys are, are, are substantial. And that what that creates, it creates a situation where you have several signals coming, but one is really loud and the other one is really soft. And uh, if there's a potential that this one will overpower this guy even though they're not co champ Okay. All right, so, so uh, oh, just the last bullet here. Even if you balance them at one point in time, since they're all coming from different locations due to the rain fades and all the things that we covered so far, they may end up being different over, over some period of time. So that's FDMA implementation. There are two approaches of FDMA, <coughs> right? So uh, I don't know if this one is very clear. Let me draw another picture so uh, that will help me explain. Uh, I'll draw it. Let's uh, look at the, there are two ways how this can work. One way is one carrier per link, and the other one is what is called signal connection per K. So let's uh, discuss the difference. I'm going to, for the sake of example, I'm just going to look at connection where you have one satellite. Let's say this is the guy in two, and this is the satellite. And then I have three first stations, right? One, this is the second guy, and this is the third guy. And uh, I'm going to call this guys A, B, and C. For the sake of example, I'm going to assume that uh, there is a need for two-way communication between A and B and A and C and every possible direction. <coughs> so how many different uh, paths I have? How many different communication paths? Well, yeah, you said C. So, so A can be communicating with B, A can be communicating with C, B can be communicating with A, B can be communicating with C, and C can be communicating with A, and C can be communicating with B. So there are six different paths. If I were to have N stations, then there will be N times N minus one communication paths. So how do I design it? Well, it seems, based on this, that there will, be, there will be six different links that I need to provision. If this is my uh, frequency axis and this is the bandwidth allocated to a transponder, then I have to, two, three, four, five, six. I have to divide this into six, not necessarily the same, uh, same <coughs> depends now on the traffic balancing, but let's for the sake of example assume it's six same uh, uh, bandwidth of space and then you know this is what I what my signal is this is A to B this is going to be A to C now this is going to be B B to A B to C and this is going to be C to A and C to B right so I have six different paths and then if you are A then you have to demodulate this guy and this guy and get the traffic that is directed to you, right? Uh, this is, as, as it says over there, it's one carrier per link. So for every link, you have one carrier. This, these are the carrier, central carrier frequencies, right? Uh, what's the benefit of this? Benefit is, is as an earth station, when you demodulate, you just demodulate your portion of the spectrum. If you're R8, you're going to listen to this guy, and you're going to listen to this guy, and discard everything else. Put the proper filter, get these portions of the spectrum, and, and you're done. What is bad about it? It's very inefficient. From the, from 
one of the courses uh, in your past, if you took, for example, PCS, we talk about it extensively, segmentation of the spectrum is not a good idea because what it does, it reduces your trunking efficiency, right? Maybe there is nothing that A wants to send to C, right? And there's a lot of stuff that it needs to send to B. In this scheme, it will, it will, you know, overload this link, and there will be nothing to be sent here, right? So the fact <coughs> that there is nothing to be sent to C will slow that will will not that that would not be uh, leveraged to increase the capacity on A B link. So A would have a cap capability maybe in its power even to send more, but because the way how it's designed on a system level. It, is, it was bottlenecked by, by this particular assignment. This is what we call trunking efficiency, and we saw in, in, in other courses that that's not a good way to approach it. The best way to utilize spectrum is to allow everybody to utilize all of it and then have a radio resource management algorithm that manages that access, but uh, especially in data services. When you need to send a lot of data and everybody else is quiet, then you leverage, then you get the benefit of being able to expand across the entire spectrum. So that's one way. The second way is what is proposed here, and this is what is called uh, a single connection per carrier. Now in this case, here's the same picture again. This is frequency F, this is the bandwidth of your transponder. Now, since you have three earth stations, then you're going to have Essentially, these connections, A sending to B and C simultaneously, B sending to A and C, and then C sending to A and B. In this case, if you had the N, N users on the ground, you're going to have essentially N, uh, N divisions of the transponder space. And this would be, let's say, three signals. Why do I draw them different power? Because I want to stress the fact that because they're in a different location and because of the fading and all this stuff, this is one of the things that we have to deal with, right? Uh, that, that potentially these signals will come to the satellite receiver having different powers. Now, what is this now? This is a data sent from A on the uplink, but it's intended to both B and C. This would be data sent from B intended for both A and C, and this would be data sent from C intended for both A and B. Now in this case, if you are A, then you have to demodulate everything here, right? A demodulates this. The, the, all of this spectrum, not all of it is, is sent to A, right? A lot of it is going to be sent to B and C. But, you know, you, you'd rather spend more time in complexity on the hardware or, or, or what's on the ground. It's just uh, electronics. Once you absorb the, the development cost, it just goes by how much it weighs. So it's not that expensive. But save and improve your spectral efficiency in space, right, where you have you have to make sure that you utilize every hertz as much as you can. Now in this case, I think this is given on a, on a, on a second slide. This is, this is also allowing you to, to balance the traffic, right? If A is sending in this portion of the spectrum, and there's nothing to be sent to C, then B benefits from that. The throughput towards B gets high, and vice versa. So you have the, this, for example, that this is from A to B, and then there's a lot to be sent to B and a lot to send to C. But when B sends back, it has way more to send to C than to A, and so on. So you have auto, kind of automatic uh, traffic shaping there, depending on how much traffic does go from one station to the other. This is the outline of just a simple, uh, simple block diagram of uh, how the structure of the Earth station would look like. On the sending side, it's the same. You aggregate your data, all of your P1s coming in. You multiplex them on a single single uh, baseband signal. Then you modulate this signal, essentially creating this waveform. Then you upband that to whatever is the frequency of the carrier and send it to, to, towards the cell. On the receiver, you're going to receive all of this, right? 
you're going to receive your own signal because the satellite is just going to repeat it, right, and send it back, right? So you may get your signal back, but that one you discard because you know that that's the data that you have, unless in some really sophisticated ways when you use that to double the capacity. And so you're going to discard your own, but then you have data that is in both of these that is intended to you. So you're going to receive that, demodulate both the signals from B and C, then you're going to demultiplex and look at what is coming towards you, and whatever is not coming towards you, you kind of discard, and whatever is coming uh, towards, towards you, you use. Right? So A receives the data for both B and C, B would receive the data for both uh, um, uh, A for A and, and, and C as well and discard it appropriately if it doesn't need it. Okay, so let me, let me spend some time <coughs> to go there. Let me uh, I do those slides. Let me talk about to other schemes, just uh, to contrast that, and then I'll go back to, to uh, further details on FDMA for today. So that's how uh, frequency division multiple access works. How does the uh, time division multiple access work? Well, in that case, in the, in the case of uh, TDMA, the, your uh, uh, let me just give you here an overview. Of the unit. This is a time division multiple access. In time division multiple access, the, the user are inter, users are interlaced in time. So if I were to sketch what is going on, here's the frequency axis associated with the satellite transmission. This is the bandwidth of your transponder. And then this is the time axis. Uh, just a simple drawing here. Let's say I have three earth stations and here's the satellite receiving and then sending back the signal to the ground. Here, the transmission will occur like this. You can think of uh, time now segmented into time slots, and when they're transmitting, each one of the Earth station would use the entire bandwidth. So first, you're going to have your I guess user one transmitting over this entire bandwidth. Let's say this is the duration of the transmission of this guy. And this time here is going to be referred to as time slot. So this is a time slot one where the signal is being transmitted. I'm drawing it as a box. This is a power spectral density of the signal, right? And this is the frequency. So you have the first guy sending. Then the first guy will stop its transmission. And then in this time slot, you're going to have a next transmission being on. Uh, I'm testing the, the limits here of my ability to draw. So let me actually do it like this. There is another transmission here. That's a second guy. I don't know if you can see now anything, right? So let's say this, let's try this one. So that's the second transmission, and then you can think another box here and so on. And then after you're done, maybe best way to do it is this guy is transmitted in this time slot, then this one transmitted in this time slot, and this one transmitted in this time slot, and then they start repeating. So here, the satellite essentially, uh, see there's, there are these gaps in the transmission on each Earth station, but what comes from the satellite is all of these signals put on a single transmission where all of your time slots are used. So this is user one, user two, user three, right? They're all coming now on the same way. So this is user one, user two, user three. The the beauty of this thing is that it's, it's uh, really spectrally efficient because it does not have to use any gardens, right? There's no, when you get to spectrum, you know, frequency, uh, uh, when you get to spectrum, 
then you get to use the entire bandwidth of the transponder. Now the catch here is the synchronization, right? You have to make sure that every one of these satellites is synchronized, right? So that they don't step over one another. In general, satellites, from what I'm drawing here, assuming Earth stations, these guys don't move, right? So if they don't move, or if they don't move of, of any big speeds, this synchronization is, and you're talking to geostationary satellites, then once you establish this synchronization, you can maintain it relatively easy. The problem starts happening if you have uh, satellites that move, like uh, LEO satellites and, and, and LEO satellites, and then if you have, uh, uh, so then in that case you have to do uh, some overhead to make sure that these guys are synchronized. Um, okay, the, uh, another thing that it might not be easy to see here, uh, uh, but to uh, see why is that of big importance, but we'll talk about it in just a second, is that this scheme is relatively robust to the differences in the power between individual Earth stations. Because right? they are not simultaneously existing in a, in a transponder, then uh, there is no uh, possibility that one will overshout the other one, that, uh, that there will be mutual interference between different Earth stations. That is a problem in both FDMA and even more so in the CDMA axis. So that's an overview of TDMA. We'll talk more about it uh, when, uh, I think next time where we talk about uh, in detail about TDMA. And then the last one that uh, I wanted to mention, and, and then we'll talk more about FDMA in specifics, is a CDMA. CDMA stands for co-division multiple access. Here, the signals exist simultaneously in both time and frequency. So they're utilizing the transponder simultaneously. They're interfering with each other, right? They, they come uh, at the same time, and they're sharing the same frequency space. So if you were to draw the same diagram, the diagram might look somewhat like this. This is your time frequency axis. This is your power spectral density of the of the waveform, this is the bandwidth of the transponder, and then what you have is, let's see how I'm going to that. Uh, what you have is, like this. So, this is your entire signal. but uh, and it exists uh, in the same frequency space at the same time. But if you look at it, the power-wise, this first, this is your first user, second user, third, third user. So you have this guy here with its power spectrum density. Then you have this user here. And then you have the one on the top. So there are three users that are co-spectrum and co-time. Now the question is, how do you separate these guys? Well, they are encoded in a special way so that the receiver that decodes all three of them can actually convolve the entire signal against the signature sequences that make the signals of the other ones on top. Right? And, and, you can, and you can eliminate these signals and then just listen to, to its own. Now, this one is very sensitive to the difference in power between individual users because the, uh, if you're not useful signal, you are actually interfered. And you are here, uh, there's, you have to go to a great extent to make sure that uh, see, uh, the, the power of these signals that are reaching the transponder are, uh, are uh, approximately the same, right? And that involves quite a frequent feedback back and forth that maintains the power. That, uh, that, uh, performs the power control, making sure that your transmitters, that nobody in this system is shouting. Okay, so let me uh, talk about two, um, two things uh, for uh, that uh, uh, there are two uh, 
important issues. Let, let's go back to FDMA and talk a little bit more in detail about some things that control uh, assignment of FDMA. So when you do FDMA, there are two issues that that you're going to be uh, dealing with. Let me just, or two most important issues, two issues. First one is an issue of adjacent channel <coughs> interference. Commonly abbreviated as ACI. <coughs> and the second issue is intermodulation problems. Those are the two issues that uh, you have to deal with when you're when you're utilizing frequency division multiple axes. Let me explain the first one first. So remember, and, and what I'm going to do is uh, explanation is the same, but in all of these examples, I'm going to assume that you have a single uh, single channel per carrier, right? So that we're using the second of the two, right? Where where you're sending one link from a given earth station and then the traffic is parsed at the receiver end. There's, it's not much different for the other one, but most of the systems are implemented that way. This is a more efficient way of, of utilizing the spectrum. So what happens, what is adjacent channel interference? Well, we have, uh, we're sending modulated waveforms. Now you know very well that when you modulate a uh, carrier, then the, the spectrum of that signal depends on, on uh, several things. But the most importantly, it depends on the uh, pulse shape that you're using for transmission. And since all of these pulse shapes are of the finite duration in time, that means they're infinite in the spectral domain. Right? If, you take a, if you take a pulse in a, in a time domain, what is it Fourier transform? Same. Same. So it is infinite in a frequency domain. If you start rounding it, then these skirts in the frequency domain start being smaller and smaller. But whenever, as long as it's finite in a time domain, it has, it has to be infinite in a spectral domain. That's like a fundamental thing of the Fourier analysis. So what does this mean? That means that if I put a carrier here, uh, the, even though I say nominally you use these portions of the spectrum, there will be some skirts that will extend, extend, you know, into other spectra that are not assigned to your particular transmission. Think about, let's say, if I were to use, you know, a square pulse, then this would be your sink, and there will be some ringing, you know, to the left and to the right. If you use rays cosine, as we use mostly, then, you know, uh, pulse, but then you have to truncate your, your impulse response the result of the truncation is going to be some spectral lobes that are extending into adjacent spectrum. Well, if you start putting multiple signals like that, it is easy to see that you can never really separate them in a frequency domain. There will be still a portion of this energy that will leak into the uh, adjacent portion spectrum and into this one and vice versa, right? They will interfere with each other. It is important for, for, for you to realize this has nothing to do with the transponder itself, right? It is not caused by the transponder. This occurs at the input of the transponder and is a consequence of the fact how we modulate signals and the fact that you can never really get rid of your side lobes completely. So there's a certain amount of a bleed over of the energy from <coughs> one transmission to the other. When does this, when is this not important? Well, if the signal to interference ratio is high. When is the signal to interference ratio high? Well, two things need to happen. First, the side lobes need to be relatively small, which is somewhat in your control. By se you're selecting the pulse yourself. You can round it, make sure that your, that your, uh, uh, that your uh, side lobes are small. You also, before you send it, you will pass it through a out-of-band uh, filter that will put a S-sharp of a cutoff for your frequency that you're using 
and try to suppress all your side loads. So you can get these side loads relatively low. But one of the things that I try to draw in this, because in these previous curves, is to highlight that the fact that since you have transmission from multiple earth stations, the signals may come at different power levels. So if you don't take that into and manage that, what may happen is, even though these side loads are low, because this, this signal temporarily faded, then your signal to noise ratio degrades, right? Signal to noise plus interference. And your interference from the reuse becomes significant, right? So to combat this adjacent channel interference, there are several things that, that uh, need, to be, need to be considered. First one is type of the modulation that you use. You have to select the modulation types that have relatively uh, relatively smooth phase transitions so that your out of band interference is relatively small. So that's the first uh, thing that we need to select. The second thing that uh, you need to keep in mind is that you have to do at least some basic effort to make sure that these powers are relatively close to one another. If you have a signal that is very strong and a signal that is very weak, even the weak side lobes of the strong signal may actually be significant, cause significant interference to the to the adjacent weak, weak signal. Right? The third thing, the third thing, the thing that is in your control is the size of the garment. Right? If you if you make these garments larger, you are actually moving away the, these two signals and placing them in a in a lower portion of the signal energy of the side lobes of the adjacent signals. But we know that that's the last resort. Why? Because what happens there, there's a bigger portion of the spectrum that are used for garments, and the spectral efficiency of your transmission is reduced. And then the last thing that you have to take into consideration is at the receiver now, you also have to do filtering. So you have to, uh, uh, the receiver also needs to be highly selective at the earth station to be able to reject these adjacent channels with, uh, with a sufficient attenuation. And that, uh, uh, that is somewhat easier task because uh, you can actually have a pretty good filters and uh, as you deploy at, uh, at the earth station. This is, it's kind of funny how all of these courses, it's, uh, it's almost like I'm teaching always the same course. This is the, this is the uh, power spectral density of a digitally modulated signal. This is what we're going to cover, I think, today in digital communication. G of F is the pulse shape that you use, right? And, and this is the, this is the uh, Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function of your symbols. Now, symbols, remember the Hoffman encoding and statistical encoding, you, you tend to make the symbols decoded, right? So they, their autocorrelation function is noise-like. Therefore, the Fourier transform is constant. So pretty much these first two terms end up being constant. So you're really, the shape of your digitally modulated signal is dictated by the pulse shape that you select. And that's why we never use square pulses for signaling. We always round them. And probably the most popular are <coughs> raised cosine, uh, raised cosine or Gaussian pulse shape, uh, pulse shapes. So that's one uh, thing that uh, is inherent to the frequency division multiple axis so adjacent channel interference. And as I said, it is important for you to remember this is not even, the, this is the property of FDMA is such. It doesn't really depend on anything on the transponder side. This interference exists at the input to a transponder. And transponder really cannot do anything to mitigate it at that point because transponder has, it just takes whatever comes in and amplifies and sends it back. But in doing so, transponder has ability to add more of its own noise. So let's talk about how does that happen. The vital, the most fundamental component of the transponder is its amplifier, right? Amplifier, what does the transponder do? It filters the signal of input, then takes it, amplifies it, converts it to a different frequency, and sends it back. So the, it's really just a amplifier, right? That's the, that's the one that does work. The rest of it is just uh, there to make sure that the amplifier works properly. 
where amplifiers are non inherently nonlinear devices, right? You actually, it is the nonlinearity that makes amplifier amplifier. Right? Uh, and what, as such, they actually have what is called input output transporters that looks like this. Inevitably, you know, the transponder will have to saturate because you don't, if, if, if nothing else, you're limited by the power source that you're using for your amplifier. An amplifier cannot generate higher power than what comes out of the, its battery, right? So it will amplify linearly in certain region, and at some point it will start losing its gain, which that region we call saturation. You're driving the amplifier into saturation. We talked a little bit about it when we talked about peak to average power ratio of, of the waveform, and you, what, what the discussion back there was, well, you want your entire waveform to stay in this linear region, right? You want it, you never want it to, uh, to uh, enter this region. The reason being your waveform becomes distorted now, right? Your peaks are being compressed and not amplified properly. Well, what the discussion here is slightly different. Right? Now you're actually using, having, sh sharing the band. So it's not your own signal there. Uh, it's not only your signal that is within the transponder, but it's the signal with the other signals. And what happens as a consequence of this non-linearity, non there is what is something called spectral regrowth. And what that means is that out of band frequencies for your signal start having some energy. Because the system now becomes non-linear, the signature of the non-linear system is that it starts generating frequencies that didn't exist before. And what happens is when, when that starts happening, you know, where are those frequencies going to go? Some of them will fall back, right back within your band, right? And those guys are going to reduce the uh, signal to noise ratio, carrier to interference ratio for your own signal, right? But a lot of them will actually fall within adjacent bands, corrupting the adjacent signals. And if adjacent signals happen to be weak, then you have a problem where this nonlinear amplifier amplifying the strong signal would actually completely suffocate the, uh, the, the weak signals. Right? So in FDMA, it is of, of a significant, significant importance trying to make all of the all of the signals that are being within the transponder bandwidth on the same path. That's really different than what we have in a broadcast. Right? In broadcasting. You may have different uh, radio stations, right? They exist in this room. They're of vastly different power, but because this is your end point, the receiver, you are not bothered with that. As long as you have a good selection filter to remove the strong one, you're okay. But here the situation is different because you're trying to amplify the signals that are of a different power, right? And the two things would happen there. First one, you're going to have cross interference because if you if you start entering this nonlinear region, the second one is the gain for the lower one is going to be small right? because everything is going to be dictated by the power. The gain that you can use is dictated by the power of the of the strong. Is there a benefit with uh, cascade gain amplification stages? Uh, the, the, there is a there is a benefit. Uh, what, what is really difficult to do is to design an amplifier that has a very high gain and very linear, uh, the extended linearity. One of the things that allows you to be linear and all of that is feedbacks. Well, feedbacks tend to, uh, uh, negative feedbacks, but feedbacks tend to extend the linearity range of the amplifier but reduce their gain. So a lot of times if we need to have uh, high gain and linearity, then we, then we actually have multi-stage amplifier. Also, there are a lot of techniques that we use to linearize these guys, and, and that's a science of its own. There is even some ideas. Is if you know what this linearity is, you can pre-distort the signal so that when it gets amplified, it is, how should I say, re-distorted back. <laughs> re back. Or you have, you have several ways. Now, the problem with these things is I drew this, this is, a, I kind of put this equation here. This is the simplest way, assuming that the amplifier has no memory. A lot of them work with 
hysteresis, and it's it's a really really complicated science of its own. How you linearize the, the these amplifiers? There are in in in, uh, in just a uh, in nutshell, there are two types of amplifiers that we use on satellite. One is what we call solid state amplifiers. They are very similar to the amplifiers we use in uh, RF systems on the ground. They are transistor based, right? <coughs> solid state. Uh, they are typically of a lower gain. Right, so if you're at a lower frequency, then these amplifiers are, are kind of taking over and being used more and more. But the, the ones that are uh, operating at high frequencies, and that have to be high power just because the frequencies are what's called TW, uh, traveling wave tube amplifiers, TWTAs, they're non-linear. They give you good gain, but they're non-linear. And then linearization of those is a problem. So there are two amplifiers, uh, and, and, and both of them have the memory aspect to them, so the linearization is not the easy thing. So just be cognizant of this. I think uh, I'm going to actually stop here because I'm going to pick up next time. Uh, there's no way to squeeze everything in a single. So next time we're going to pick up from here. I'll go through an example of what happens when you have multiple signals so that you can see where is the origin of intermodulation happens. And then we'll talk about how do you need to do that. Seven.